Assalamu alaikum, everybody, and welcome back to another uh, Lecter Leem lecture today. And today it will be delivered by Wakar Amdi Saab. But uh, let's not waste time and start with Tilawat. And if I could ask Roshan Amdi to please uh, recite a verse from the Holy Quran. I've just recited is from the Holy Quran, chapter 33, verse 22. Um, the translation of the verse is as follows I seek refuge with Allah from Satan, the incursed, in the name of Allah, the gracious, ever merciful. Verily, you have in the Prophet of Allah an excellent model for him who hopes to meet Allah and the last day. And who remembers Allah much. Jazakallah. Jazakallah, Roshan Sahib. Uh, lovely to love it there. Uh, Allah bless you. Right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. And I'm pleased to say that Wakar Ahmadi Sahib, uh, who's the head of religious studies at a secondary school in Birmingham and of a sixth form, and is author of a number of uh, student textbooks on Islam. He serves as the additional secretary for Talim Education in the Ambia Muslim Association UK and has been a very dear friend of mine for many a years. So without any further ado, Wakar, if you could please enlighten us with your short lecture. Thank you very much. I'm um, just trying to share my screen. Hopefully it can work. Can you confirm you can see the slide? Okay, I'll just try that again. Okay, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Um, uh, in the name of Allah, uh, the most gracious, ever merciful. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Nadeem Rahman Sahib and the uh, Talim Education Department of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Association for giving me the huge privilege uh, today, but also a uh, huge pressure uh, of speaking this evening. Uh, I'm very aware that our audience today hails from a variety of ages, uh, backgrounds, and also beliefs. And my aim today is to try to cater both for Muslims and non-Muslims, for teachers and students, uh, and also those with a keen, um, but also a casual interest in the subject. I'm very happy to make my presentation uh, notes and references available uh, after tonight's uh, session. And there are many more references that I can share than what I have, uh, I'm able to share in the limited time I have tonight. And hopefully you can see the contact information um, so that you can get in touch with me if need be. I'll also ensure that I keep a close eye uh, on the clock to see uh, if there is any questions towards the end, uh, which will be in the last quarter of, uh, of the evening. Um, I'd like to firstly um, set a bit of context uh, today's talk. Um, I am personally a member of the Ahmadiyya Muslim uh, community and professionally, I am a teacher of religious education. 
And it's largely due to my upbringing, I would say, that as an Ahmadi Muslim and the training that I received from my, my parents at home and also by leaders and elders within my community, that is the reason that I ultimately decided to become uh, an RE teacher. Uh, the respect and value for people of all faiths and none that was instilled in me as a child is now something that I do as part of my job day in, day out. In the classroom, though, I'm a teacher, not a preacher, and I embrace fully the need to be objective and indeed be critical of a vast array of beliefs and viewpoints that I must share with my students. And that applies when I teach about personalities who I personally consider to be special uh, and holy, such as Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and of course, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon them all. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he is regarded as one of the most influential figures in history. Somebody who is a huge inspiration to billions of people around the world, but not necessarily to others. His life is an open book. The ocean of literature that has been written about him, from the earliest Hadith texts to the work of modern scholarship, exposes him to unrelenting scrutiny. As a result, he has been loved and revered, but also hated and ridiculed. And these will continue to be the case in the future. However, that should not stop us from conducting our own investigations to determine whether our own conclusions uh, about him uh, or to determine our own conclusions about him. The title of the lecture this evening is the Prophet Muhammad's treatment of non-Muslims. Now this seems to be quite uh, limited in its scope and may even seem to be uh, irrelevant, some might say. However, what I wish to show is how multifaceted and far reaching this topic is and how perhaps more than ever, this is more pertinent at this point in history. And the more I delved into this topic as part of my research, the more I knew that one hour simply would not be sufficient. And I apologize in advance for this, but I hope that what I have selected is enough for us all to embark on a path of learning and also inquiry. So let us begin with the circumstances um, that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, was born and raised. He was born in a city called Mecca in Saudi Arabia, which was a thriving city uh, of trade and also a center for pilgrimage. The Arabs were well known for their hospitality, but other than this, there wasn't much that was really praiseworthy. There were no schools in the whole of Arabia, which is why most Arabs were illiterate, including the Prophet himself. Arab society was steeped in gambling and alcohol abuse. Slavery and incest was rife. Women had no rights whatsoever. And some families were so affected by poverty that if girls rather than boys were born to them, many would end up being buried alive. Add to this, they were habitual idol worshippers and made money from this too, keeping their gods in the Kaaba building, which originally was actually built for the worship of one god, but over time had become a storehouse for several deities. So this was a society in need of drastic change, a social and spiritual revolution. And it is at such times that in religion, it's believed God sends a prophet. So prophets are sent to perform uh, two main tasks. The first is to draw attention to fulfilling the rights of God himself, known as Hakukullah. And the second is to draw attention to fulfilling the rights of God's creation, known as Hukukul Ibad. Now, this is the same purpose for which Muslims believe as many as 124,000 prophets have appeared throughout history. Belief in all the prophets is a fundamental Muslim tenet and indeed constitutes one of the six articles of faith. I think it's important to understand why, though, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is unique. It is believed that his birth 
in Mecca was the answer uh, to the prayer of Abraham in the city, in the same city, two and a half centuries earlier. In chapter 2, verse 130 of the Quran, it says that Abraham's plea was to God for him to send a special messenger in the future to that same city. Also, as far as Muslims are concerned, the appearance of Muhammad in Mecca actually fulfilled a prophecy contained in the Old Testament about a prophet like Moses appearing in the future, as it states in the book of Deuteronomy 1818. In fact, it's on record that many Jews expected this prophet to appear in Arabia, and hence a number of Jewish tribes actually ended up settling in Arabia long before the prophet's appearance. It's also interesting that many expected this prophet to actually be named Muhammad, as per the Song of Solomon. And it's also on record that as many as 15 people were named Muhammad around the time of the prophet himself. So there was an expectation uh, that an important figure, a divinely inspired uh, reformer would be appearing there and soon. And Muslims believe that with the appearance of the prophet of Islam himself, all those prayers and prophecies came to pass. So the um, Holy Quran, which is the uh, sacred Muslim uh, text, uh, describes the Prophet Muhammad in a number of uh, glowing terms, uh, among them the Prophet being a light and also being described as a mercy to all people, or Rahmatullil Alameen. The Quran also states that about the Prophet Muhammad, as was recited uh, very beautifully by Rashan earlier on, that you have verily in the Prophet of Allah an excellent model. The distinction with the Prophet Muhammad as compared with other messengers and prophets that came before him was that he was the only prophet appointed to be a universal teacher. Muslims believe that all previous religious founders and messengers and prophets were for a specific time and a specific people for a particular purpose. But the status of being a universal prophet and teacher, Muslims believe, was reserved for the prophet of Islam himself. And this is one of the reasons why he is also called Khatamun Nabiyyin, or the seal of the prophets. Seal meaning that he attested to the truth of all of the prophets that God has sent throughout time. And not just that, but also that he combined in himself, in one individual, all the great qualities that previous messengers had. With that distinction also is the revelation of God's final message, the Quran, to the Prophet. So we have uh, some distinction here applied to the Prophet as compared with other messengers and prophets before him. And he is the only Prophet to be described in these terms. And as the Quran also states, that as far as the uh, process of religious evolution is concerned, it reached its summit with the advent of Islam. Now, in terms of the uh, purpose of the Prophet Muhammad's coming himself, his purpose was to invite uh, people to Allah and to restore Tawheed or the worship of one God. And this is captured in the basic fundamental Muslim creed, which is known as the Kalama Shahada, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah, meaning there is no worthy of worship except God and Muhammad is his messenger. Previous religions and holy books, Muslims believe, although they were originally from God and they served a specific purpose for that time, unfortunately what happened with the passage of time is that a lot of these scriptures have become unreliable or corrupted or maybe they were not fit for the future and they were supposed to be specific for a particular people and time in history. So the Quran is obviously unique in that respect and so the Quran also therefore replaces all previous revelations. As far as Muslims are concerned, uh, Islam is God's true and chosen religion, perfected with the appearance of the Prophet Muhammad, and it's also promised victory over all other belief systems. Muslims believe that the work of the Prophet is also to be continued by his followers, the Muslims, so that the message of truth and also basic human values 
can prevail in the world. And this, in fact, is the means of establishing world peace. Um, so we refer to the reason why the Quran had to replace previous scriptures. Uh, I've also given reference to um, a teaching of the Quran where it talks about the doctrine of Trinity and the concept of the sonship of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. And Muslims believe that although Jesus himself did not claim to be divine or to be part of a, a trinity uh, concept of any sort, that this was something that was added to his teaching and his person afterwards. And so the Quran says that this is considered to be blasphemous and that the idea that God has a son is described as a monstrosity. And also shirk, which is the Arabic word for setting up partners with God, in all its forms has been described as being unforgivable. Now, even though, and this is the point I'm coming on to, that even though the Quran is very emphatic and denounces the belief uh, that is associated with shirk or with the Trinity, for instance, despite that, it still promotes respect and encourages dialogue with people of all faiths and backgrounds. And so those things did not stop the Prophet himself from being loving and just towards those who held those beliefs. So for the purpose of today's uh, talk, um, I think it's just for ease of reference, uh, makes it more convenient to divide the focus into three main areas. And I think we need to keep this context in mind that I presented uh, when we explore the status and indeed the purpose of the Prophet Muhammad's coming. So let's look at these in turn. Firstly, the Prophet Muhammad's commitment to freedom of thought and belief for all. Secondly, his respect and regard for the beliefs and sentiments of others. And thirdly, his commitment to the protection of the rights of all belief systems and their followers. There are, in fact, too many examples to cover. And there is no way that I can do justice to this in the space of the next uh, 30 minutes or so. So what I intend to do is just to give uh, a flavor um, as to why Muslims do believe that the Prophet of Islam championed all of these throughout his life. So we'll start with his commitment to freedom of thought and belief for all. So what I presented here are some examples of uh, quotations and teachings from the Muslim holy text, the Quran in which um, it is categorically stated that every human being on earth has the right and freedom to believe in anything that they wish. And one of the most famous parts of the Quran is that verse that you see, there is no compulsion in religion. I just wanted to just add a note here is in relation to the references that I've given here. In some versions of the Quran, the verse uh, Bismillahir Rahman Nirahim, or in the name of Allah, the most gracious, ever merciful, is counted as one of the verses. And in other versions, it's not. So if there is a discrepancy uh, between one verse and another, uh, based on the same reference, that will be the reason for it. Uh, the Quran also states, uh, for you, your religion, for me, my religion. Now, the word religion there is a translation of the Arabic word deen. And deen is actually more broad than just religion. Deen refers to any way of life. It can also include atheism. So the emphasis here is on freedom of thought and conscience to people of not just people of religions, but also those of no specific faith. The Quran also teaches that one of the purposes of creating human beings was for them to get to know one another, for them to interact, for them to enter into dialogue. This is how society progresses. So sometimes differences can be a blessing also. The Prophet of Islam is described as an admonisher uh, and a warner, but he is not appointed as a keeper or as a guardian over anyone. I think it's interesting to note that a lot of the emphasis that the Quran lays, and also in the more elementary forms in previous uh, scriptures, um, the emphasis that Islam gives is very clear and very emphatic and seems to be a mirror of what later was enshrined in the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. That was in 1948, which is almost 13 centuries after the Quran had advocated 
some of these same uh, rights and, and freedoms. Now, in relation to the Prophet's uh, respect and regard for the beliefs and sentiments of others um, and the followers uh, of other faiths, um, the Prophet went further than simply just supporting freedom of thought and liberty of conscience. He laid enormous importance on the need for respect and having regard for not just the, the views and beliefs, but also the feelings of the people who hold those beliefs dear to them. And that was true of Christians, of Jews, of idol worshippers and others also. Now, it is a fundamental uh, belief in Islam to believe in all prophets and to believe in all uh, divinely revealed scriptures. And this is relevant because it recognizes the great status of previous messengers and texts and lays a secure foundation for interreligious peace. Now, one of the um, tasks of every Muslim, uh, as far as they uh, possibly can, is to convey the message of what they consider to be a true guidance from God to others as well. But the Quran also advises on how to do this. And it says you should be respectful. It says in Surah 16, verse 126, call unto the way of thy Lord with wisdom and goodly exaltation and argue with them or interact with them in a way that is best. So it advises Muslims not to get into a confrontation, not to become argumentative, but actually to start a dialogue, to start that process of interaction respectfully and with courtesy. Uh, there are a number of references in the Quran to uh, relationships uh, with the people of the book. And there are a number of different interpretations of what that phrase or term actually means. And in simple terms, uh, it refers to those who are monotheists uh, from any religion in history. And the Quran also pays immense tribute to people who come from such traditions and talks about their commitment to God in the early hours of the night where they prostrate to God in humility. And this is praised by God himself in the Quran. The Quran also encourages believers to come to an equal word with people of the book. So here the emphasis is on mutual interaction, on cooperation, on dialogue. Now, it's also important to note here that, and this is linked very closely to why the Prophet was so respectful of people of previous traditions, is that although for Muslims the Quran is the most sacred text, it only came to its complete revelation in the Prophet Muhammad's 23rd year of his ministry. And up to that point, he was receiving revelations every few days or every few months, and so on and so forth. Now, until he was given a teaching or new guidance about a particular situation or a matter or an issue, it was his common practice to stick to the teachings of the Torah, the Old Testament. And so sometimes what used to happen was that uh, even uh, many members of Jewish tribes would come to see the prophet for judgment or guidance on an issue. And unless the prophet had received uh, specific guidance in the Quran, and even those Muslims that came to seek his counsel, he would refer to the Old Testament unless and until a new teaching had been revealed to him. Uh, there's also uh, an interesting uh, incident in the time of the Prophet where uh, a Muslim and a Jew were having an argument um, and the argument was about which of their prophets was superior. The Jew insisted it was Moses and the Muslim insisted it was the Prophet Muhammad, naturally. And they got into quite a heated argument and uh, out of frustration, the Muslim slapped the Jew on the face. Now, when news of this reached the Prophet, um, he was very upset uh, with the Muslim. And he said to the Muslim, do not give me superiority over Moses. He was very conscious of how just declaring his superiority over Moses, even though that's what Muslims believe, was a sensitive issue, and he should not say that in the manner that he did. On another occasion, uh, the Prophet Muhammad was sat with his uh, companions, his followers, when a funeral procession was passing. And all of a sudden, the Prophet rose to his feet 
and he stood still. Now, his uh, followers were very surprised at why he stood up, and uh, they thought maybe he was not aware that actually the coffin that was being carried was that of a Jew. And the Prophet responded immediately and said, is it not a living soul? And the lesson he wanted to impart to them was that every single human being has a soul, and that soul comes from God. And therefore, there is an emphasis on the sanctity of life, regardless of what belief or faith you might follow. And also, I think it's important to note how sensitive the prophet was to uh, days uh, and practices that are precious and special to people of other faiths. One example of this is the choice of Friday as a holy day for Islam. Now, one of the uh, wisdom uh, behind that choice is that it avoids clashing with the Sabbath, which starts on Friday sunset to Saturday sunset for Jews, and also avoids Sunday, which is a day of rest for Christians. In addition, um, when a decision was being made uh, by Muslims on how to announce the time for prayer, Muslims are conscious that Jews usually use a shofar, which is a, a musical horn, and a lot of churches would use a bell. So a decision was made that um, the human voice would be used instead. So these things might be considered sort of insignificant, uh, but I think they do demonstrate the importance the Prophet gave to each religion maintaining their distinct identity. Um, I think there's also something to be said about um, when I mentioned earlier on uh, in the talk about how um, the leaders of Mecca used to make a lot of money out of the worship of gods and statues that were kept in the Kaaba. Um, now, at the fall of Mecca, which if I have time, I'll come on to a bit later on as well, um, Muslims uh, emptied the Kaaba of all the idols and statues, and they were smashed because it was restoring that house to the original purpose that was designated for it. Now, unfortunately, this account has been uh, misunderstood or misconstrued by uh, extremist organizations uh, who believe that it was a license to just walk into any temple and do exactly the same thing, and it wasn't. We see an example of this uh, in Afghanistan in 2001 when uh, very famous Buddhist statues were blown to smithereens. Uh, and one of the reasons given was that this was following the practice of the Prophet Muhammad when he had conquered Mecca, and although that was peaceful, um, but because the Kaaba was originally built many centuries before for the worship of one God, that was not respected and honored. And it was for that reason that those idols were smashed. So it wasn't a, a, a kind of a permission or a license for Muslims to do the same. Now, even with idolaters, as the teaching in front of you says, um, the prophet was taught to maintain respect for their sentiments as well. It states, and abuse not those whom they, that is the idolaters, call upon besides Allah, lest they, out of spite, abuse Allah in their ignorance. The third uh, area I'd like to just focus on is his commitment to the protection of the rights of all belief systems. Now, of course, you know, we do know that there are many similarities between Islam and other faiths. For example, the shared concept of monotheism, uh, the commitment to prayer, uh, the need to give charity. These are all common features uh, between all religions. But there are also some significant theological differences as well. But yet this never stopped the Prophet from upholding the rights of other religions and also to protecting their places of worship. Um, so this particular verse uh, that refers to uh, the protection of cloisters, churches, synagogues and mosques refers to a war context. And... If there's time, we'll come on to explore more about jihad or um, physical warfare, as it's understood in many circles, uh, and the reason why the Prophet had to fight certain battles in self-defense. But one of the reasons given is that he fought for the protection, not just of Islam and Muslims, but also for the protection of the institution of religion as a whole. And it's quite interesting to note that in that particular passage of the Quran, and anyone can pick it up and refer to it if they wish, the Quran is an open, accessible book, 
that mosques are mentioned at the end of that list and that churches and synagogues, for instance, are mentioned beforehand, which I think is quite significant. Um, there's also the uh, famous uh, Charter of Privileges. This was a document that was signed by the Prophet Muhammad himself um, that uh, was a guarantee uh, to safeguard uh, Christian holy places until the Day of Judgment. And so again, this shows the Prophet's commitment to ensuring that uh, holy places and sacred sites of uh, other faiths, in this case Christians specifically, are protected uh, until the Day of Judgment. Now, what I've said so far might seem to be very appealing, very attractive, um, and it's been all sort of uh, quite um, lovely and beautiful so far. Uh, and that's all well and good, a lot of people would say. But surely this isn't the full picture. You know, we know that Islam and the Prophet Muhammad are not really as innocent or as untarnished as Muslims like to make out. And this is where I'd like to take this talk on to next. And I think there's a, a number of examples that provide us a useful context to look at this angle from. So we know that within the last few decades and, and more recently, in, even in the last few months and years, um, there have been a whole host of controversies uh, that have uh, been very successful at presenting Muslims and Islam also in a particular light. Um, now, one uh, instance of this is the controversy surrounding the Satanic Verses, uh, the book that was written by Salman Rushdie in the late 1980s. And as a result of writing that book, um, the Ayatollah Khamenei in Iran had issued a fatwa or a decree uh, calling for Rushdie's death because, according to him and many other Muslims also, that the uh, punishment for uh, committing blasphemy is, uh, is death. Is, is, is the death penalty. We also have seen uh, how Muslims themselves have behaved uh, through committing uh, acts of terrorism, uh, how they've responded also to other cases of what they consider blasphemous. So the Danish cartoons, the Charlie Hebdo uh, magazine, where the uh, cartoonists were gunned down in, in their own offices. Um, the whole host of things where Islam never seems to be out of the headlines and is it any of any surprise that as far as islamophobia or fear of islam is concerned it is at its highest than it's ever been so in recent surveys uh last year for example uh, it was um discovered that a third of britons who were surveyed um were designated as having a fear of islam and muslims uh, also there was a, an interesting survey carried out by a charity called Show Racism the Red Card, which was a questionnaire uh, that was uh, completed by 6,000 10 to 16 year olds from more than 60 schools here in the UK. And half of the students that were surveyed agreed or partly agreed that Islam encourages terrorism. And obviously we see a lot of these issues come up in relation to free speech, uh, the, the burqa, Sharia law, uh, the so-called Islamification of Britain, uh, you know, these are all what I would say are, are defining moments in, in shaping in shaping uh, social attitudes to Islam, to Muslims, and of course, tracing it back to uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him himself. Um, you might recognize some of these faces, um, but um, they have all one thing in common, and that is that they have all uh, been um, guilty of or exposed or have uh, been highlighted as having said um, some pretty um, honest things from their point of view about what they think about Islam. And these range from popes and pastors to politicians and, and media pundits with varying levels of, of insight and influence, it has to be said. Uh, but they all have one thing in common in that they seem to trace modern instances of extremism within Islam back to the founder of Islam himself. And just to share a few examples briefly, um, the Pope, uh, previous Pope Benedict in a speech in Germany uh, was quoted from a, uh, a book according to which he said that the erudite Byzantine emperor Manuel Paleologus II had said, show me just what Muhammad brought that was new 
and there you will find things only evil and inhuman, such as his command to spread by the sword the faith that he preached. Now, although the Pope was quoting uh, the emperor, whom he called erudite, um, and didn't directly say that he agreed with the emperor's comments, but nevertheless, him just quoting the emperor was construed as an endorsement of uh, the emperor's comments. Uh, Geert Wilders, a Dutch politician, um, said this about the Quran. He said, the Quran is a fascist book which incites violence. That's why this book must be banned. This book incites hatred and killing and therefore has no place in our Dutch legal order. Uh, Pastor Terry Jones, who you see in the image in the center of the Dove World Outreach Center, uh, led a campaign some years ago uh, called the International Burn a Quran Day. And he launched this uh, campaign because, according to him, Islam is of the devil. The Quran calls for the killing of non-believers. And he also says that Islam uh, teaches that apostates should be killed. Robert Spencer, uh, the author of The Truth About Muhammad, the founder of the world's most intolerant religion and director of Jihad Watch, is also somebody who almost is making a career out of his uh, opposition uh, to Islam. Not that that's a problem. Uh, what I'm trying to do here is to highlight the, the criticism and objections that are made and to see whether there are uh, valid responses that Muslims can also give. So there are just uh, a few examples of individuals who are uh, often in the limelight for criticizing Islam. So I can see I've got just under 10 minutes remaining and I'm going to be as quick as I can with the remaining part. Uh, but the criticism of the Prophet can be summed up in there are many other criticisms that are made about him and about Islam, but I think the, the three main ones are about jihad and warfare, about apostasy, and about uh, blasphemy. So just in the interest of time, uh, very quickly, just uh, as far as Muslims are concerned, um, the context for fighting, as far as the Prophet was concerned, was very clear. The Prophet was suffering, along with his community of followers, in Mecca for 13 years, where they lived as pacifists. They were being tortured, they were being oppressed, they saw their loved ones being killed in front of their own eyes, and they had no choice but to uh, migrate to Medina. But they were not safe in Medina either. And therefore, under God's command, um, Muslims believed that uh, they were given permission to fight in self-defense. And even though they were outnumbered in that battle of Badr, which is the first battle that was fought, um, and remember, the Prophet himself was 54 years of age at this time. Um, so he wasn't in the prime of his youth, quite the opposite. Um, and yet, so it was a desperate situation that Muslims were facing, and unless they defended themselves, Islam itself would have been wiped out. And the Quranic references that you can also look at more closely later if you wish, make this absolutely clear. Whenever there is a reference to war, or lesser jihad, as it's more specifically called, uh, it always is from the point of view of Muslims being the ones that have been attacked first, and the ones who had to migrate as a result of the persecution they followed. Um, Apostasy. This is another bone of contention uh, for many uh, critics uh, of Islam. Um, and it is very true that in the world of Islam today, there are a number of Muslim states that still have the death penalty for uh, the offense, as it's called, of leaving your faith. Now, there are references also in the Hadith where it says that uh, those that leave their religion are to be killed, so they are to be subject to the death penalty. Now, there is a need for some context here, and this is part of the context. The Hadith are one source of authority for Muslims, but they are secondary to the Quran, which has the utmost and highest authority. The Quran does not mention any punishment, earthly punishment for apostasy. At the same time, as I said earlier on, that unless the Prophet Muhammad had received any specific guidance or teaching from God in relation to uh, a problem or, or an issue or a situation that arose, he always followed the Old Testament. And it's on record that a lot of the cases where apostates were put to death was because of that being the teaching of the Old Testament. And that also applied to Jewish people themselves. And many Jewish leaders came to the Prophet uh, for him to pass judgment on various uh, situations and the prophet actually gave them the option of either following the Quranic rule or following the Old Testament rule 
And where they chose the Old Testament rule, it clearly says that apostates should be put to death. Um, and the reason for emphasizing that is because even though apostates uh, were killed also in other situations, they were not killed because of their apostasy, they were killed because of their acts of treason against the state. So it was because they were a menace to the state rather than because they left Islam or any other faith for that matter. And there can't be any contradiction between the Quran and the Hadith. And that's why you see that quote, very famous quote from uh, Aisha, the wife of the Prophet, uh, where she was asked how she would sum up the Prophet of Islam. And he, uh, she answered that he was the Quran personified. You know, the, the character of the Messenger of Allah was the Quran. Uh, in relation to blasphemy, as we've seen, you know, Muslims seem to be very sensitive and, and get very upset very easily when their faith is attacked uh, and say that any act of blasphemy has to be punished with death. Now, the Quran does refer to many types of blasphemy. And it also says that even the belief that Jesus is the son of God is also blasphemous. But you don't see many Muslims calling for the death of Christians for believing in that. Also, at the same time, blasphemy is committed on a daily basis against God more than the prophet himself. Blasphemy is committed against other religious founders and prophets. And yet we don't see the same reaction. But the Quran also says that you should not make any distinction between any of the messengers. Now, in terms of blasphemy itself, we have plenty of evidence from the life of the prophet that he did not punish it in any shape or form. There were many people who were up to a lot of mischief in his time. There were a group known as the hypocrites who were trying to undermine and destroy Islam from within and also ridiculed him in the process. And not once did he ever punish them. And there's one very famous example of an individual named Abdullah bin Ubay, who was throughout the Prophet's time in Medina, a constant thorn in the Prophet's side. Um, you know, he undermined the Prophet at every opportunity. He was also at the center of spreading a vicious false rumor about the Prophet's wife, Aisha, being guilty of uh, unfaithfulness to the Prophet, to the point that he even caused a strain in their relationship before God revealed a verse exonerating Aisha. Abdullah's own son, who became a Muslim, was so um, devoted as a Muslim and so upset that his own father was getting away with ridiculing the Prophet that he was ready to kill him, and the Prophet forbade him from doing so. Abdullah bin Ubay died a natural death, and this is what was amazing, is that his funeral prayer was even led by the Prophet Muhammad, who even wrapped him in his own shirt. So these are cases where blasphemy was committed to the prophet in the prophet's time and wasn't dealt with with any form of punishment. So where do Muslims get this idea of uh, blasphemy or apostasy uh, being capital offenses? Well, part of the reason is that actually the prophet himself foresaw that a time would come in the future when Muslims themselves would be um, empty of righteousness, that they would call themselves Muslims, that mosques would be full, but there'll be lots of um, corruption, uh, there will be lots of misguidance that would emanate from these mosques. And that's why in this teaching here that you see, the Prophet describes uh, how the people of the future and the mosques that would belong to them, he refers to them as their mosques. He refers to their scholars as their scholars, which suggests that he is distancing himself from the Muslims of the future who would be doing these things. Um, is there a solution to this? Well, as Ahmadiyya Muslims, uh, we believe that there is, um, and that is, and this is what I'm going to finish off with in the interest of time, that there was also uh, a prophecy of the Prophet that in the future um, a Messiah and Mahdi would come, whose mission it would be to act as an arbiter. So in, in a time where there were all the many denominations and Muslim sects, there will be one true sect who Ahmadis believe was founded by a person named Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, who appeared in India, whose purpose was to reform not Islam, because Islam is considered perfect, but to reform Muslims. And we see plenty of example of that today. Um, and the work of the founder of the Ahmadi Muslim community is being carried on by his uh, Khulafa or his successors. And the present Khalifa is Hazrat Nizam Musur Ahmad, who is globally seen and is accepted and acknowledged as being uh, a voice 
uh, that needs to be heard. Um, unfortunately, in the interest of time, I'm going to have to stop there um, and uh, apologize. I wasn't able to get through uh, a lot of what I intended to get through. But as I said, it is a huge topic indeed. Um, and I hope that just with a few glimpses of the Prophet's own life and the example that he led uh, of how to ensure that there is respect and courtesy and love extended to people of all faiths and none. Thank you. And make sure we can actually go through all of our questions uh, nice and easy uh, uh, from our audience. Uh, so if I start off and then I'll ask uh, Saba to read the next question. And if I start off with the first one, and that is from Hati Bevakas, and apologies if I pronounced it right. Uh, he says, Assalamu alaikum. Did the Jews really settle in Arabia because of the prophecies in their books? about the coming of the Greek prophet, or was it mainly due to the economic or social reasons? Jazakallah. Yes, sir, thank you for your question. Uh, that's absolutely correct. Um, one of the purposes of moving to Medina was uh, because of uh, various conquests and revolts that were taking place in and around Jerusalem. That is on record. But when it came to choosing where to settle, it's also on record, and we can provide references if need be, that um, the reason why a lot of Jewish tribes had chosen Arabia to settle in is because of the prophecies in relation to the coming of a reformer or a prophet who was going to be like Moses. Jazakallah. Uh, the next question is from Sabaha Chaudhry, sir. Assalamu alaikum. I wanted to ask if shirk is an unforgivable sin, how can we still say Allah is all forgiving if he will not forgive shirk? Jazakallah. Okay, very good question. And this has been addressed um, very uh, profoundly by the founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, uh, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, in his uh, book, Haqiqat al-Wahi, or the philosophy of divine revelation. And he's made a distinction between the verse that refers to um, how shirk is unforgivable, uh, in this life, so if somebody has committed shirk or they have been guilty of idol worshipping, then obviously that case is between them and God. The Quran also states that Allah is all merciful and that his mercy encompasses everything. And there are other references of the Quran. I can't remember the actual reference. I do apologize, but we can get that reference for you uh, where it says that uh, God forgives all sins. Now, there was an interesting uh, situation at the time of the Prophet Muhammad himself where for a lot of his life, he was being protected by his uncle, uh, Abu Talib, who was an idol worshipper. And towards the end of his life, the Prophet was trying to convince Abu Talib to uh, recognize that God is one uh, and that idol worshipping wasn't uh, the way to uh, to sort of the state to die in. Um, and Abu Talib uh, did not become a Muslim. He died as an idol worshipper. And the Prophet did say that I am forbidden for praying for you. But that doesn't mean that God is not going to forgive you. So the uh, sin of shirk or committing idol worship uh, is described as being unforgivable in this life. But God is all forgiving. And what happens on the other side of death is obviously in God's omniscience and knowledge. And as far as the Quran is concerned, it does seem to suggest that all sins will be forgiven. And this is also supported by a tradition or a hadith of the Prophet, which is found in the book Ganzul Umul, which is a very famous book of hadith accepted by many schools of thought, um, in which it says that a time will come when hell will be empty. Uh, and again, that just reinforces the belief that God is all forgiving and a time will come and all will be uh, forgiven. Um, that's not to say that obviously Muslims are also going to be guilty of many sins. So this principle applies to everyone. We also see shirk being committed in Muslim communities also you know, being uh, worshipping at graves or putting your trust in um, these fake sheikhs, you know, who can sort of heal you or, or tell you about the future. These are also uh, forms of shirk that are committed even by Muslim communities themselves. So shirk isn't exclusive to the people of Mecca in the past who used to worship those particular deities in the Kaaba. Uh, shirk can be manifested in, in all 
uh, shapes and forms. And we see that within Islam itself. So it's just a reminder that a Muslim should be uh, worshipping the one God as part of their belief in Tawheed. Lovely, thank you. Um, another question on our YouTube channel from Etisham Khan, and he says, my question is, Abu Jal was the Holy Prophet Wasallam's worst enemy. How was the Holy Prophet Wasallam's treatment to him? Very good question, Etisham. Um, the same as it was to anybody else. Uh, the Prophet didn't make any distinction uh, in his treatment of anyone uh, based upon their status uh, or otherwise. Um, so, you know, he was consistently noble and virtuous and and just and loving towards everyone. Um, and we know of many cases where, uh, and the current Supreme Head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community has been mentioning a lot of these accounts in his uh, series of Friday sermons about the, uh, the early companion of the Prophet uh, and narrating all these accounts where the Prophet was being targeted by people like Abu Jahl and the response that the Prophet gave. I mean, for the first 13 years in Mecca, the Prophet didn't lift a finger against anyone. Him and the early Muslims were not allowed to do so. They were pacifists. They had to be persevering, they had to be patient, they had to be steadfast. So the moment they were abused or physically tortured, they just took it. Um, and that was part of their training, in fact. So to suggest that when they went to Medina, all of a sudden, all that training went to waste, as some uh, Orientalists have suggested, uh, doesn't quite stack up. So we see that the Prophet was consistently loving and benevolent towards any, everyone, whether they were his friends or his enemies. Jazakallah. The next question from YouTube is from Mukit Khan Sahib. How did the Shirk get to Saudi Arabia? Um, the second Khalifa of um, Ahmadiyyat, Hazrat Mizza Bashir the Mahmud Ahmad, Rizal has stated in his book, Life of Muhammad, which I would suggest is an excellent read, um, that... Um, Although originally the Kaaba was built as a house of worship for one God, so it was uh, based on the principles of Tawheed, even since the time of Adam, it's believed. It was then restored or rebuilt in the time of Abraham and his son Ishmael. Um, and then after Abraham, what the second Khalifa of Ahmadiyyat says in this book is that people, because faith weakens over time after the appearance of a, of a prophet especially, and, and therefore, they feel as though they're not worthy of reaching God directly. They have to go through a medium or, or, or some other sort of mechanism. And that's how idol worship started, in fact. That idols came to be formed, and it was believed they had special powers that would intercede for them. Um, and obviously, we knew that from the time of, of Abraham, maybe that was something he was conscious was going to happen after him as well. And that's why maybe he prayed that there was going to be a special prophet in the future who was going to come in Mecca and that, as far as Muslims are concerned, was fulfilled. And that's why the Kaaba had to be emptied of those deities. Lovely. Thank you. Francesca Cook writes, uh, can you please type up the Pope Benedict's quote in the chat box? I'm sure we can provide that later. That's fine. Yep. Um, the original um, article that was uh, obtained from me is actually in The Guardian. Um, I think it was 2008, if I'm not wrong. Uh, but I've got the reference for it. Uh, it was a speech that he gave uh, at a university in Germany um, in which he quoted at length from this uh, the Byzantine emperor. Uh, and although the Pope apologized afterwards, um, many people were not satisfied that he didn't distance himself from the actual um, uh, content of the, the quote that he had cited. Um, but absolutely, we can provide the, the reference there. And also around the same time, I believe that the leader of the Ahmadi community delivered a whole sermon responding to the accusation that the prophet was uh, a terrorist, God forbid, and that he spread his message by the sword. One of the references I was going to share was of Mahatma Gandhi, who wasn't a Muslim, who said that the sword had no part to play in the expansion of Islam. It was just the prophet's own virtuous example. Um, so these can also be provided, not a problem. Jazakallah. Uh, the next question is when we say people when we see people saying a negative things regarding Islam ie on social media should we set up and defend Islam even if we do not have sufficient religious knowledge or should we just pray for that person okay so as far as the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is concerned and our tradition has been to do both um, so the first port of call is also 
uh, is, is to pray, in fact. Um, and uh, the founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, uh, Hazrat Mazwalam Ahmad, um, himself has actually also explained that uh, in his commentary of the verse in Surah Fatiha, Ehdin Nasirat al Mustaqeen, the promised Messiah, uh, peace be upon him, stated that when you are praying, Ehdin Nasirat al Mustaqeen, which for the benefit of uh, non Arab speakers uh, means God guide us to the straight path. The Promised Messiah Islam, stated that this includes not just Muslims, but you should also be praying for non Muslims uh, and your own community members. And to not be doing so is to go against the spirit of the of the Holy Quran. So prayer for guidance is actually for everyone and anyone. Um, and obviously, where an opportunity is given, uh, or there is a case where uh, your beliefs are being criticized, um, of course, you can take one or two options. You can simply ignore it and keep praying for the person, uh, or you can engage in a dialogue with them. I think the training that Ahmadiyya Muslims have specifically with the uh, inspiring, inspiring guidance and example of our leaders themselves and our Khalifas is that they will always be based upon uh, reason. Uh, they will be with courtesy and respect. When the Danish cartoons controversy arose, along with other cases of blasphemy against the Prophet, um, I mean, my own father, Muhammad Rashid Amisa, wrote a fantastic book uh, responding to Salman Rushdie's uh, satanic verses, whilst <coughs> Some Muslims in Iran and other places uh, were calling for Rushdie's death for offending the Prophet. Our leader at the time, Hazrat Musa Tahir Ahmed, may Allah have mercy on him, counseled Ahmadis to uh, respond with the pen. So jihad in Islam, which is, means a struggle and an effort, is to be proportionate. So in the time of the Prophet, because the sword was used against the Prophet, there came a situation where he was permitted to use the sword in response, but in proportion. And in the same way, if the pen is being adopted um, today to attack your faith, and it doesn't just apply to Muslims, it could be up to anyone, then you should respond in, in like manner. Um, so in, in summary, in answer to the question, I think prayers are obviously of the utmost importance, but as we know, uh, effort is also uh, extremely important. So prayer comes with effort. One without the other is meaningless. Lovely, Wakar. Um, in terms of your speech, uh, we put up points at the time of the Prophet were like journalists and cartoonists of today. Francesca Cook asks, could you recommend poets? Poets? I uh, what we're talking about. Okay, maybe... Um, that might be misconstrued. My my point uh, in the notes was more in relation to how today, when I was referring to cartoonists like Charlie Hebdo, uh, cartoonists who had um, drawn offensive drawings of the Prophet Muhammad, and how many extremist Muslims had responded by gunning down those uh, cartoonists in their own office. The point I was trying to make was that the Prophet, in his own time, faced constant blasphemous and insulting comments. And there were poets uh, of his time who were like the journalists and cartoonists of today. Um, so that was the point being made there. And despite being insulted and offended on a daily basis by those poets, uh, the prophet never uh, asked for any consequences for their, uh, for their insults. Uh, and so the lesson there is that Muslims of today, you know, if they are being offended or attacked as far as their faith is concerned, then, you know, the Quran invites dialogue. It encourages people to uh, to enter into discussions. There's nothing to shy away from. Um, so in the same manner, uh, the same should be done in the cases of uh, critics of Islam when they are presenting their arguments. Of course, as far as Muslims are concerned, it is our responsibility to respond, but in a way that is polite and courteous. Sorry, I'll take over, I think, uh, Sabah's mic's off. Faraz uh, Miran asks, according to the charts assigned by the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings of God be upon him, should any Muslim countries also act upon it and protect either the Christian or the Jews? Yes, I mean, that particular charter is preserved to this day at uh, St. Catherine's Monastery in Egypt. Um, and it would be very odd 
and wouldn't be consistent with the Prophet's own life and teaching for that to be only specific to that monastery in Egypt. It was a declaration to, and if that, it was a promise on behalf of all Muslims made by the Prophet that they would protect their places of worship. Um, so that is a, a, a principle that Islam encourages, that Muslims are expected to follow. Um, and unfortunately, I think it was three years ago, uh, ISIS actually uh, launched an attack on that very monastery, ironically. Um, so that shows how much uh, of Islam they were following at the time. Uh, but the Prophet's guidance was very clear in terms of the uh, rights of protection given to churches, but also obviously that extends to all religious places of worship, uh, as the verse I presented earlier about how synagogues, cloisters, churches also need to be protected, uh, not just mosques. Lovely, Bakar Sahib. Um, I, I would love to carry on, but time has caught us up as per usual. Uh, and it's just left for me to say that Jazakallah uh, to all our viewers and listeners uh, around the world. Uh, may Allah bless you. And remember, same time, same place tomorrow, we'll have a lecture with Ibrahim Ahmed Noonan, uh, who will go through some interesting facts. So until then, may peace and blessings of God be upon you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Well,